What's going on guys? This is Brian from Advancement Hockey Advising here. Today we have another special interview here with sports psychologist Dr. Matt Brown. Now basically Dr. Brown, he doesn't have a huge background in hockey but he's recently started to work with hockey players as of late. Basically he has a big background in football, had a really tough neck injury and that's what kind of led him to translate um, into the sports psychology world. So honestly hearing his story is incredible and uh, you really see his thought process and his mindset. He really drops some key knowledge bombs for you guys in terms of mindset and how to deal with adversity and all these kinds of things. So you, you guys should really get a lot of value out of this conversation. I hope you guys really do. I know I definitely learned some things coming out of it. So it was an awesome conversation and I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Before we dive into the video here, as always, just a quick reminder to absolutely destroy that like button if you haven't already. And if you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward. All right, guys, let's dive right into the interview. All right, so Dr. Matt Brown, glad to have you here. How are you today? I'm good. Yeah, we're uh, I'm in Calgary, and we have uh, these Chinook winds that blow in from time to time and take us from minus 25 to five. So uh, yeah, so we enjoy that when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, in Montreal, it's not that extreme here, but for sure, I I, I know the feeling absolutely. So uh, I guess I guess we can get started here. We'll just dive right into it. Why don't you tell sure. us a little bit about yourself? You know, your journey and everything, and what you do now. So I I. Was I played football in college and uh, was uh, the beginning of my second year and zig when I should have zagged and uh, went hell on to hell with another player and uh, ended up breaking my neck and that uh, that ended my my football journey and uh, and it was a struggle getting through it honestly um, you know I didn't really seek out help and I was kind of reluctant to to do that because I just didn't feel like I could find someone who would really understand mm -hmm. uh, why it felt as as badly as empty. Um, as uh, and, and paralyzed by the whole thing uh, as I was, even though physically I was I recovered fine, and uh, and that eventually led me to the idea that you know maybe maybe that's something I should pursue. I uh, couldn't play football anymore because of my neck, but uh, switched to decathlon and did that for uh, for a number of years. Nice. And, and while I was doing that, I uh, uh, you know I continued to make my own observations about kind of what's what's hard about the, the mental side of sport, and and uh, became more and more. In intrigued by are there things that could be done that uh, that give someone an advantage in that uh, in that respect so so everything from the the mental health side of it to the performance enhancing side that curiosity grew and then ultimately i pursued a, a graduate level did a, a master's degree in sports psychology and then a, then a phd in counseling psychology very cool so obviously breaking your neck is definitely a huge like a huge challenge to overcome. Like I've had my fair share of challenges. None probably compare it to that. And uh, it's, it's, it's big adversity, right? So how, like, what do you think got you through uh, that moment and, you know, the mental challenges that came after, you know, breaking your neck and stuff from football? You know, the biggest thing was um, I just realized how, <clears throat> how important sport was to me and how mm -hmm. uh, how how big a part of my identity being an athlete was and so so probably the biggest thing that got me through it was switching tracks and getting into the decathlon and uh, and I was never I was never the decathlete that I was a football player but uh, in a way that was good um, mm -hmm. because it, it gave me an outlet a place to train and compete and push myself and you know and, and kind of switch back into athlete mode uh, but um, but then when I was done with that the probably the transition was easier because I was excited to get on to other things. Got it. Got it. So maybe if someone's going through, you know, a, a struggle or a challenge or something like that, that they can't control, let's say it's your situation. Would your advice be to, you know, if obviously they're, they're all their own individuals and, and obviously it's everyone's situation is different, but would your advice be to, to maybe find something that's related or, or something else that's close, kind of like you did? Well, I, if, I think the biggest thing is just recognize that you are not your sport. It's like it's the easiest thing is just to grab onto an identity and say, I'm a hockey player, I'm a football player, I'm a dancer, I'm a musician. Uh, because, you know, ultimately, especially in sport, like there will come a time when your body just can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the, the highest level, that's going to be halfway through your life. Mm -hmm. You know, and and if you if you don't see yourself in broader terms, if you don't see yourself as a, as a person who has qualities that plug really well into hockey, but could plug into other things as well, 
uh, then you're heading for a crisis. So, so seeing, seeing your sport or anything, any passion that you have as, a, as an outlet, something that you uh, grab onto in order to express who you are, that's a healthier way of doing it than saying, no, I am a hockey player. Huh. because that's a, that is a sinking ship. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. I, I totally relate to that because I feel like I clinged on personally to that identity. Uh, and then when, when it came time after college hockey to kind of, you know, hang up the skates and, and not play super competitively anymore, it was definitely a very difficult uh, transition, you know? And I definitely feel that, that if I would have, yes, if hockey was um, part of my identity, but not completely part of it, I think it would have been an easier transition to move up move on to something else and just make it easier overall. So I think that's a great point. You are not your sport. You're not just a hockey player. You're more than that. It's, it's tricky, right? Cause it is, it is easy to be and convenient to do that. And when you spend so many hours, you know, dedicated to something, you know, it's, it's the most intuitive thing. But, uh, but if you, if you say like, no, what, what's important about me is that I can score goals or throw a football or, or whatever it is, then when it's, you know, when you have to move on, you're not just grieving a loss of your sport, you're grieving a loss of yourself. And that is a bigger mountain to climb if you can get over that at all. Mm, for sure, for sure. I think too, not just moving on. I think while you're in it, if you're just clinging on to, oh, I score goals, you know, if when you're not scoring goals, which inevitably it will happen, then I feel like it's a huge part to not only as a hockey player, but as your yourself, your identity. And you just, it just, you go on that roller coaster, right? So what's something players can do uh, to kind of escape that to, like as they're playing what can they do not to just say hey i'm a goal scorer what's a better strategy well i, I talk about kind of a, a bubbled approach to your sport where you know when when you leave when you leave the rink like mentally leave the rink go and you know be be with your girl go take a class go read a book go you know, do other things that allow you to plug into different aspects of who you are uh, and when you catch yourself uh you know thinking about the game which every player will yeah. Uh, just tell yourself, no, like I'll, I'll get back to that once I walk back into the rink. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you, it gives you permission to let it go, which actually is going to help you as a player because, uh, if, if you allow your hockey mind to, to shut off, uh, it can refresh. Yeah. So you come back at it the next day, you walk into the rink uh, and you see it from a fresher, newer perspective. Do, and then doing the same thing where your family and your girlfriend and your classes you're taking, you leave them outside the rink. When you walk in there, all that you're focused on is, you know, your game and your team and the team you're playing against and, and how you're going to problem solve to, to beat them and giving yourself permission to leave, you know, other uh, aspects or, or even problems from your life outside of that. So if you, yeah. if you, you know, have that performance bubble and then you respect it going whichever way you're going in or out of it, it, it can be, uh, it can be really powerful. Mm, that's a good way to put the performance bubble in a way like you're you kind of bubble yourself in the rink let's say when you leave it you leave it there type thing now i know from experience that's easier said than done i know it's 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 a great point to be present at the task at hand whether it's playing hockey or when you're with family being present there and not letting other things creep in but i know it's easier said than done so how what are some ways to you know stop those, those thoughts like maybe not stop those thoughts but almost like Put those thoughts aside if they're they're not serving you in that moment if they're you know if you're with your family and the hockey thoughts come creeping in creeping in what are some strategies you can do to be more present at the task at hand there, there's a and when you describe it to people it sounds uh, almost hokey but there's a technique that you can use called parking where when you walk into the the rink you know you you've entered that bubble and so you go what okay what am i focused on but then if, if, you know, maybe you're thinking about an argument you had with your girlfriend or uh, still thinking about something else that had happened or you're, you know, you've got a relative that's sick or whatever. When you, when you take your street clothes off and switch into your training gear and you, and you hang those up, you take the rest of your life and you're like, you know, symbolically hanging it on a hook. You know, and, and then when you, and when those things pop back into your mind, which it will, right? Because if it's something important, it's going to, you know, try to occupy some space, some space in your brain. Uh, you say, no, that's on a hook right now. And especially if you recognize there's nothing I can do about that right now. Mm. So any, any attention to it is, is wasted and yeah. disruptive. Uh, but then when you put those back on, the same thing happens. You go, okay, now I go back to thinking about something else in my life that's really important. Uh, and that's why it was trying to poke its head into my practice. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then you, and you go back to giving it its due attention, 
mm-hmm. uh, at a time in the day where now you're refreshed and you train and you are with your team and you and you feel better and so you'll probably look at it from an angle that's healthier anyway. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I think that the symbolic nature in your mind, putting it on the rack and saying, no, right now that's where it belongs. I'll pay attention to it when it's time, but right now it's time to do this. I think that's a great way to kind of separate yourself and do that. And to the point you brought up, I think if you can't do anything about it right now, if you can't control anything about it right now, like what's the, the question I always ask myself is what's the point of thinking about it right now, if I can't do anything. So I think that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, I kind of want to move in a slightly different direction. So um, we kind of talked, that's one of the pitfalls for sure when it comes to mindset, but what are some common pitfalls that you see, you know, athletes go through uh, with regards to mindset? You know, with, with a lot of athletes, the trap they fall into is thinking that the mindset that worked for them when they were younger will work as they move up you know, mm-hmm. kind of through the ranks. Because uh, when you're little, you, like every day you go to the, you know, the court or the rink or the field, like you get a little bit better. And so in terms of kind of balancing positive and negative, the players who are really hard on themselves, they have an advantage because they're, they're adding that, that critical kind of negative piece to continue pushing them forward. Mm-hmm. But they're also getting better so quickly and, you know, that, that the success has come very naturally. Yeah. So those two things are in balance. But the thing is, you know, as you know, the learning curve, it levels off mm-hmm. over, you know, over time. And so you get to a point where you're not getting the same progress back for your efforts that you did as, you know, as a younger athlete. And then you say, well, are you more or less, you know, hard on yourself now than when you were little? And they say, oh, way more. Yeah. So that that negative grows while the positive is is atrophying. <laughs> and then, you know, you can find yourself in that, you know, where the scales tip towards the negative. And then, that, then a whole bunch of things can happen. You become more frustrated. You lose confidence. You become more anxious about, you know, your performances and your training and where you're headed. Uh, and it can just really cascade in terms of making it really tough, not, not only to perform, but to enjoy something that, you know, you grew up loving. Mm, for sure. I, that's like such a great point that some things that served you in the past might not serve you as time goes on, you know, and that's, that's one thing. It took me a while to, to learn that, but yeah, like that, like bashing on yourself and all that kind of stuff, like being self really self-critical, maybe in the past it served you with in a couple instances, but will it serve you moving forward? You know? And I think that's a, a great question to ask yourself. Okay. Is this working? Is this serving me at, at the high, highest level? Are there alternative strategies that I can kind of take? And I feel like we don't always take the time to, to ask those questions. Well, in the, and it's important to continue to be self-critical. Like, you know, once you stop doing that, you know, you can't continue to progress, mm-hmm. but, but when those scales start to tip the, you know, towards the negative, mm-hmm. then you just have to be that much more deliberate of what's positive. No. Nope. So you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're paying more attention to what's good. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're training a positive voice in your head. You know, that's, that's telling you, I can, I will, I am. And then you can have the best of both worlds because you, yeah. you, know, you can be self-critical in that constant kind of move forward mode, uh, but, but retain your, your energy and your confidence, which is so important. Absolutely. I think it's uh, it's kind of a spectrum of the positive and the negative. And I think it's a lot of people and myself included when I was younger and when I played, uh, I'd either go swinging towards the negative completely sometimes, and then I go swinging all the way towards the positive. And usually the truth and and the, the right way to go about is somewhere in the middle. You know, I think it's good to, to acknowledge the negative parts. Like it's not just sunshine and rainbows all the time, but I think, you know, being going too much on that and it hurts your confidence. But if you go too much on the positive end, it gets delusional. So how do you go about finding that balance somewhere in the middle? We have to be deliberate about it. Mm-hmm. You know, like the, and, and asking yourself, you know, using it as your barometer, like, how do I feel? You know, if you feel, if you feel a little bit nervous, that's good. You know, if you feel so nervous that you're physically sick, then that, then that, you're that so is the, that uh, like, no, obviously my brain is more focused on the negative right now. And mm-hmm. so I, you know, so, so I'm going to be more, you know, use more of that positive voice uh, in order to, to balance the scales. Yeah. Uh, and other times you may, f- you you say, how do I feel? Well, I feel, feel a little flat, little, maybe a little comfortable. Uh, and then that's the sign that, Hey, maybe I, maybe I'm becoming a little bit complacent mm. and, and need to pay more attention to, you know, trying to revive that feverish push to keep getting better. Mm. So it's, uh, it's again, like you say, it's easier said than done, but it's, it's just recognizing that, 
you know, what you need is going to change day to day, hour to hour. And, and if you're responsive to that, if you're aware enough of it, you can, you can adapt. You, t- you just mentioned self-awareness. How important is, is self-awareness as a hockey player? Or as an athlete in general? The thing that makes it tricky is, you know, they estimate that we have between 50 and 70,000 thoughts in a day. And when most people hear that number, there's, they're like, there's no way. But most of them occur at a level below what we're aware of, call their subconscious mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and our subconscious mind, that's the things that are kind of best programmed uh, through repetition over time. But, but after a while, we don't, we don't notice, we're, we don't notice those thoughts. We don't notice ourselves doing them. So they become very efficient. Uh, and so you can have you can have negative thoughts playing in your head that that are affecting you that are you know dragging on your confidence and your energy and creating tension <clears throat> and not even notice that you're doing it. And yeah. so 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 it's a matter of paying attention. And again, I usually start with how do you feel and work backwards. Mm. If I'm feeling miserable, probably my thought profile is not very favorable right now. Yeah. You know, once you can do that, you can figure out, okay, what, what thoughts are, are contributing to this feeling. Mm. And, and once you can identify those, then you have a fighting chance of, of manipulating them the way you want them. No, that's such a good point. And I, I never really thought about this. Asking, start, as a starting point, asking how you feel and then working backwards. Because usually starting how you feel can give you the answers. If you're feeling great, then obviously keep doing what you're doing, you know? Yeah, obviously you always, want, you always want to grow, but don't fix it if it's not broken, right? If you're feeling good. But if you're feeling off, like that's a good, that's usually a good indicator. Say like ding, 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 something, you know, something's a little bit off. Start questioning, you know, start looking at it. And that's a great way to be self-aware and to kind of see, you know, what may be not working right now. So I, that's, that's such a good way to put it. I never really thought about asking how how do I feel as kind of like the starting point to self-awareness yeah well because we, we tend to be more aware of what we feel than what we're thinking yeah um, and and partly because like once you once an emotion is triggered it changes our body so so there's a palpable feel to each of those things that allows you to identify them quickly all right so yeah I think you know when you're you're self-aware it's it sometimes you start to see these negative patterns and all that stuff and you're you're starting to feel okay, like my confidence isn't feeling that good. How do you go about, you know, um, taking the steps necessary to gain that confidence again, to go more on the positive side? What are some key things that you can do? Well, if you start with like, what are the areas I'm being self-critical about? And and then what I, what I call just, uh, if then those observations. So you say, if I spend extra time you know, working on that skill, then it's going to go from a weakness to a strength. You know, mm. and, if, and if you can kind of operationalize, like this is my criticism of my, you know, my game or my shot or what, you know, whatever it is. And so, and therefore this is what I'm going to do about it. Uh, then each rep that you do uh, of that solution becomes another kind of brick in the wall from a confidence perspective. Mm. You know, so, so making sure that you kind of, you know, actionize your, uh, your criticisms and the, in the ways of, of improving it. And sometimes it's extra reps on the ice. Sometimes it's, uh, extra, you know, video. Sometimes it's taking the things that the patterns that you want uh, or tendencies you want on the ice uh, to grow, and 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 use something like visualization in order to accumulate the reps to start to retrain those patterns. Mm. So, so seeing the solution and then acting on it every every moment that you spend uh, on that work is going to add to your confidence. I see. It, it, the other thing with with confidence is that sometimes our view of ourselves and how we you know can perform is just too narrow so you have a lot of players that like if i'm not scoring then i must be playing poorly but you know as you know there's just so many other aspects of the game so many other ways to help your team win you know you'll have a player that that goes out and they you know they're on the four check and they you know cause a turnover and they win a battle and then they get possession in the puck and they move it and then they drive the net and, and get it back in traffic and get a shot away and hit the goalie in the crest uh, and they did like seven or eight things well in order to create that opportunity, but they go to the bench and the only thing in their head was that was a terrible shot. You know, I just let my team down. And oh, so, yeah. you know, yeah. So if you sit down and you go, okay, what was good? And you notice those things, then it's okay to be upset about the thing that didn't work out. You know, I should have gone five hole or I should have gone upstairs or whatever. Uh, because your confidence at least is buffered by the quality, you know, of things that you, that you notice that you did well. Well, thank you. A lot of a lot of good points there that I kind of want to unpack. So, choosing what to focus on. Let, let's say what happened in a shift. Okay, like like you said, I think it's is so huge. 
you know, not like, cause player clearly had a really good shift, just didn't get like the end result, but he had a really good shift. So I think that's, that's so important to, to kind of keep that confidence. So how do players kind of go about that to, to make sure that what, well, like, what, what are the things that they should be focusing on while they're playing and not just like focusing on, let's say scoring or getting a touchdown in football or anything like that. What are the little things that they can use to focus on to, to measure how well they're performing in order to keep their confidence? Every player should have a sense of like, what's my DNA as a player? What are the things that, that I need to excel at to help my team? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that shouldn't be a, sh- a short list. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're playing at a high level, there should be a whole bunch of things, you know, and if you can't have that checklist in your mind or, or sometimes literally a checklist that you keep in your stall, Mm. Uh, then, uh, then you can you know go back whether it's between shifts or between periods and go well that was good that was good that was good I got to fix that I got to do more of that uh, then that allows you to be self critical but at the same time you know noticing the things that you're doing well and that gives you confidence that gives you energy and the truth is with a, with a lot of players once you, especially once you get to the major junior or, or college or uh, pro level they're pretty self critical. You know, and, and they can give you a really good list of things that they're not doing well. When you ask, well, you can, but what's what's pretty good? It stumps them. And, and there are lots of <laughs> things, true, right? or they wouldn't be playing yeah. at that level, but they, you know, they're just, their their attention is so trained to, towards the negative because it has to be in order to progress that they start to neglect just noticing, you know, those pauses in their, in their play. So even just adding, form the habit of sitting down between shifts and saying, okay, what was good? Because okay, your brain is going to notice the bad stuff for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so make sure it notices the, the positive as well so that, you know, so you're not emotionally doing this. Or the yeah. Course of the game. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, in between shifts, taking a moment to, just to notice it is so important. I always took a moment to like kind of reset first, like after the shift, you know, and then once I reset to a couple of deep breaths, then I would think about, okay, like what's going good what's going bad, the bad, like you said, it automatically comes, right? Our brains automatically go to what's going wrong, but uh, taking the time to notice the good things. And like you said, too, I think having a clear idea of what the good things are, you know, not just scoring, but knowing, hey, I finished my hit, you know, you know, I beat the defenseman in, in, in the corner uh, in a battle, you know, anything like that, knowing those good things, having them clearly laid out, I think is a great, great way to know, because when you're clear, your brain can start automatically going more to that direction too. But at the same time, not losing the, the self-critical because it's important to kind of have both in between shifts. So I couldn't agree more. Another thing you mentioned too, is you mentioned vis- visualization a while ago. And can you talk a little bit more about that? How to do effective visualization? Well, the, like the first kind of technical thing is it should always be done first person. So like you're looking out your own eyes, because if you, if you visualize something like you're watching yourself on TV, it's, it's stimulating totally different patterns in your brain than the ones mm. that fire when you're actually executing the skill. Yeah. But if you imagine it, like you're like, not only like you're looking out your own eyes, but you, that you can actually feel it. You can feel your skating stride. You can feel the puck on your stick. You can you just feel the play. Yeah. Uh, then, then the same patterns in your brain and nervous system that fire when you're executing those skills will fire when you're imagining it. Mm. And every time one of those patterns fires, it gets stronger. So yeah. that's, so that's kind of the, the basic kind of that, that's the how to, uh, but then the what to is really important as well, because, you know, if, if you ask most players to visualize at this point, like 80 to 90% of the room will say yes. Uh, but then when you say, okay, what are you picturing? You know, you can bust them, you know, cause they, they just gravitate, gravitate towards the sexy stuff, right? Like it's the big hits and the scoring goals and going top chatter and long stretch passes and windmill saves, right? <laughs> Which is, and, and, it's not that they shouldn't be doing that. It's just incomplete because there's so many aspects of the game. If you look at it, like someone in anal- analytics will say that, you know, like a great player will have the puck 2% of the time. <laughs> so, you know, and then if you say like, what percentage of the time that you're visualizing, uh, do you have the puck? And they'd be like, like most of it. You know? <laughs> so, so it just, it just exposes the fast the fact that they're, you know, they're neglecting their play away from the puck, which, you know, let's face it, when games are lost by a goal, it's, it's, it's not usually because someone failed to do something spectacular. It's, it's that they failed to execute a really basic thing. Yeah. And usually the breakdown happens, you know, one or two passes away from the point of play that from the, from the puck. Someone didn't pick up that kind of, you know, F, F two or three coming into the zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, 
so you know rehearsing those things what what am i doing without the puck what am i doing in the d zone you know where should my stick be where should my feet be pointed yeah. what's my primary responsibility and, and being able to you know to train that kind of chess match you know that it, that the game is at higher levels um so that those tendencies they you know they they happen efficiently without you having to think about it yeah yeah i know um and I didn't start doing this until later in my career, but when I did, it was a total game changer. And that's like visualizing exactly like how it feels to be in that moment. You imagine the different scenarios that could happen in the game, you know, whether it's uh, like, let's say you notice in practice that you, you missed a, a part in a battle drill, like somebody out battled you or whatever. Well, imagining that scenario, what you could have done differently or feeling how it would have felt to, to do something differently, go another direction and potentially win the battle, you know? And I think by, by doing that, you, you're, you're, you're practicing without actually practicing. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it, it really does work. And it's hard to explain on my end, but it, it does, it does make a big difference. If you can visualize different as like a bunch of different scenarios in, in the game that you're playing. Yeah. Because the game is, is you know, the higher you go, the more, detail driven it is yeah. the more you know complex it is and so uh you know where players get stuck is they're trying to remember what their coach told them but 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 retrieving instructions from a coach from your brain you know in that file cabinet your brain in real time as the play is happening yeah. it's just too slow yeah you know so so just do you know uh, that scenario based visualization can can take it from an idea to, you know, to a pattern in your brain that's ready to run. You talk about the brain and that whole pattern being too slow. How do, you know, players go about um, having good instincts on the ice and uh, just, just being like when you're in the zone, typically you're not thinking, right. You're just, you're just doing, how do you develop those instincts and be able to, you know, play without thinking, but playing with, with confidence and being in the moment and actually, you know, being in the flow and playing the game. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of it is just playing, playing enough games where you deliberate about those things because for the first little while when you're having to think about it it's slower but it's a it's a necessary part of that learning process yeah uh, but but you can accelerate that process through the through the visualizing mm. uh, and, that's a great uh, point that's a great point yeah because yeah. once you rehearse something enough in your head it becomes technically speaking it's not an instinct but it functions like one yeah because it'll it'll run automatically in that scenario as needed uh, yeah. because it's it's sufficiently trained practices that simulate games you know from a coaching perspective uh, are really important to create those scenarios you know where you have to respond a certain way but but most most players will finish a practice and wish they'd had more reps you know certain things so taking what you're working on in practice and just taking a few minutes afterwards while you're rolling out or stretching or cooling down and just and just picture yourself executing those things that you know that that too can accelerate that that learning process yeah you know but the the other thing to be aware of is there are aspects of the game where where you can't try too hard like you play without the puck you play in the d zone and play it you know in kind of battle scenarios those are all the areas where the more try the better uh, but there also are areas of the game where the harder you try the worse it goes mm. you know and and so kind of adopting and, and you know and any player can tell you that like when they when they make a nice play, you know, with a puck on their stick, it feels easy and yeah. natural. And they didn't think that hard about it. Um, and so, so the idea of being oh, effortful yeah. without the puck so you can be effortless with it is a, is a really important principle. Wow. You're, you're touching on a really good point there. And I, I agree completely is that when you're playing at your best, you're flowing. It, it feels almost easy second nature. You know, you're not, you're not overthinking because as soon as you start overthinking in a game scenario, or even in practice, if you're overthinking too much, you get in your own head, you don't perform well because it's just too slow, right? Your reaction time's off. And I think you're touching a really good point that you it want you want to practice hard, visualize hard, and and do the reps when you're practicing. But when it comes to game time, to be in that zone, to, to be second nature, so you're not um, you're not overthinking anymore and you're you're in the flow. Am I am I kind of getting at it right here as to what you're trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's some players that are very cerebral, like the real thinkers naturally. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of cases they get, you know, they get taught to believe that that's what's wrong with them. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> like, in most aspects of like, like being a thinker, like stop and think is a good mantra, but, um, but it just, it happens too fast on the ice. So do your thinking in advance. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that's where the, you know, the visualizing and kind of running through what are the things I want to make sure I do uh, and, and using that time from when you get to the rink until the you know, puck is dropped, uh, you know, to kind of run through those scenarios, and visualize it and, and be prepared for it and have those things lined up in your head so that when you, you know, when you step out there, it's like, okay, the thinking is done. I did it when it was useful, which is in that preparatory phase. Mm. Uh, now just play. Wow. You know? Okay. That's... If you rehearse it in your head, that's what your body's going to want to do under pressure. Yeah. No. Oh, so such a good point. So in advance for everyone listening in advance, is when you want to be thinking on the ice, when you step on, you want to be doing, you want to be in the zone and in, in flow state. That's what you want to be. You want it to be second nature on the bench. You can take a quick moment to reflect and analyze, you know, how you're playing all that stuff, how you feel. But then when you step back on the ice again, back in, in the flow state and, and it's a skill, it's not easy to do that. You perform at your best when you're, when you're on the ice, when you're just in the zone, not thinking second nature and all that stuff. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more with that point. It's such a strong and powerful point. You know, we talked about visualization, you know, self-awareness, looking at thoughts. Do you have any other tools that you use with your, you know, your clients and players as to how they can improve their, their mental side of things, their mental performance? One of the things is, is the ability to, to calm down and, mm-hmm. you know, to use things to kind of regulate that emotional level. And people sometimes say, oh, so do you help? athletes get pumped up and i'm like bro like (laughs) you don't need to help athletes with that like they're really good at that and the environment gets us you know elevates our emotions yeah Uh, the thing that's harder is when the you know when you're under pressure and it's in the emotions of the game are flowing to be able to you know to calm yourself down to bring it down a notch and and controlled breathing is one of the huge things Uh, and not not just in terms of you know calming the body so there's less tension so you're so it performs better but also the calmer we are, the more our vision is expanded, you know, mm. the more we see when we're out there. Yeah. You know, because if someone's kind of, whether you're too excited or too angry or too, you know, scared or whatever it is, we have this kind of narrowing of our vision. And, yeah. Uh, and, and everyone's played, everyone's had that experience themselves. Everyone's played with someone where it's like, dude, like, <laughs> I was wide open. Yeah. Uh, but if, you know, but if they're not calm enough, I think it's will to see everything in front of them. And then they're more prone to making those, you know, those judgment errors. Yeah, no, for sure. When, uh, when I was playing, I felt, I felt my best and I played my best when I was like in a nice, calm, but excited state, a nice, like happy medium. So I had, I had the excitement going, not, and I, I was very intentional about framing as excitement, not as nervousness. I was excited, but also calm, not jittery, but just like, you know, just ready to go, you know? And when I felt like that deep, uh, confident, excitement but calm like energy that was when i played my best and so you touched on you know uh breathing is there anything else you can do to kind of access that state you know i think being careful with uh music the culture of most team sports is you know you you show up and there's like the tunes are pounding (laughs) oh my god it's so true it's all pushing you towards that kind of higher emotional level and so you know with some guys if, if they made the observation that no i need to stay calmer uh, then, uh, then listening to something that's a little more low key on the way there, uh, or earlier in the day, uh, even if you know with the noise canceling headphones, you can just throw them on. And generally, people they'll leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, you can kind of you can quiet some of that noise that could otherwise get you elevated a little too fast. Yeah, for uh, sure. So it's a lot easier to to uh, stay calm than to get calm. Yeah. <laughs> so starting from a pretty relaxed state. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty good practice, and then revving up to the right level uh, instead of trying to you know kind of ride that razor's edge. Yeah, for sure. And I think coming back to one of your earlier points, I would always ask myself, okay, how do I feel right now? Actually, now that I think of it, I did do that a little bit. And if I was super riled up, you know, which you don't want to be, I play like some more calming music. I, I remember doing this, and when I was like kind of flat, you know, then I would play the revving up kind of music. When I found like I was in that that happy medium. I play like kind of good vibes type of music. If that worked for me, obviously it could be completely different for everyone, but finding the music that works for you is, is there's a reason why every athlete at least listens to music before games. It's, it just puts you in the right state. If you listen to the right music. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You just want to be deliberate about it. Like yeah. know, know where you need to get to uh, and then choose, you know, choose something that's going to help you to get there. There was a triple jumper that was Canada's best for, for a while named Oral Ogilvy. And he was a, he was very Christian and he loved his kind of Christian worship music. So he'd have it in his, you know, in his uh, <laughs> headphones playing and everyone else would, you know, assume he's probably got like hip hop or something playing. 
but that you know that's that's how he kind of created that sense of kind of peace and levity and energy and inspiration so mm-hmm. you know at the end of the day you do what works for you exactly yeah especially when it comes to music everyone's so unique just do it do what works for you you know do uh do what makes you feel the best and makes makes you perform the best in all honesty um all right so i think we covered some pretty good points here but before we kind of end things up and wrap things up um, is there any last piece of advice that you want to give to hockey players and athletes out there yeah i i think one big thing is that uh you know if you're if you're passionate about your sport, you, you, like the, the word passion actually comes from the Latin verb patoire, which means to suffer. You know, so we, when you care deeply about something and it's not going well, uh, but like um, emotionally, we just, our bucket just fills way faster, uh, mm-hmm. which is okay as long as it gets dumped out from time to time. And so uh, there's just a lot of, just a lot of emotions that go with being a high performance athlete. You know, there's, this you know sadness and regret and frustration and 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 joy and and pressure and just all those things um, and uh, as long as you have a way of getting it out so so talking it out sometimes crying it out sometimes writing it out sometimes you know going into the you know into the gym with the intention of kind of working it out um, but uh, but figure out the ways that you're going to get that emotion out that you're going to dump that emotional bucket. Uh, and then just make that part of, you know, how you roll. Because if if it you know fills up too much, it can just get so heavy. You can start to, you know, experience, um, you know, loss of that passionate, um, you know, burnout type symptoms. Um, and um, and especially just with, during this uh, whole pandemic thing, where uh, our buckets are filling faster anyway, just because of all yeah. the, the stressors and what's been taken away. So so just recognizing that you know you may be an exceptional athlete you're still human there are no exemptions you still have to yeah. go through the, all those emotions and as long as there are ways of getting it out of allowing it to pass through you you can stay healthy you know, mm. mentally and emotionally it could become a crisis yeah it's an interesting way of putting it because i i never thought about it that way but passion can be you know your your strongest fuel but the bucket fills up and you need like an outlet to, to let it out from time to time and like you said whether it's working out you could you could you know, it could be talking to, to someone that you trust about it. You know, all these things, there's different ways to do it. But I think I, it's a great, great analogy where, you know, it's a great fuel, but you got to find an outlet uh, to, you know, to have it be sustainable. So, um, yeah, great, great final point to, to kind of end things here. So, uh, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on. You've given great advice. And uh, I'm sure the viewers would love to have you back one day. So hopefully one day we could, uh, you know, make it happen and uh, have uh, a round two here. So again, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Brayden. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. That is a wrap for the interview. Hopefully you guys got some value out of this. I definitely did. I I thought it was an unreal interview and there was a lot of, you know, key knowledge and advice that we can definitely take from and use it to improve ourselves and have for you guys to have more successful hockey careers. This mindset stuff is really important and that's why we've had so far two sports psychologists come on because it really, really is key to master really to get to the, you know, to the next level and to be successful in your careers. All right, guys, that's pretty much it. If you enjoyed the the video and if you haven't already consider hitting that like button it really goes a long way and if you're new here and if you want to see more content like this moving forward consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward also too if you have anything you want to talk to us about any questions anything whatsoever feel free to drop a comment down below or send us an email at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can all right guys that is it for the video thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you on that next one.